faces I know. <laughs> and straight away at the top there is a name I'm going to struggle with. Akla Dakla, I'm sorry I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, Apricot Droop Fruit, Asus Borrow Dust, Commander Root, Darius Elevator Simulator, Freddy Bot. If that's a bot, then hi anyway. Um, Elevator Simulator, oh no, you've been you've been greeted twice, why not? This is going very well, I'm I'm tired. Graf Bloodwurst, Elsie Pablo, Medellan, Pond Pimp, R Primus, Chimera, and Tycheline, the other bot. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome back. We're going to carry on with SSAO today. It has been a good week, so I'll just do a quick recap. Um, from the Lisp side of things, I've got another 20 episodes out of uh, Little Bits of Lisp. I'm planning on doing more. I think I'm going to start doing um, a lot of small episodes on CFFI. I know we did that long episode, but I want to break them down into kind of like the normal chunks that we do, like five minute, 10 minute videos maximum. And go through all those, do a bunch of CFI stuff, because there's a good bit of stuff there to cover. Um, I'm still working on the episodes for compilation and symbols and packages. I'm not happy with where they are yet, as I'm going to keep on researching and doing that for a while. Um, and yeah, what else has been going on? Oh yeah, fixes for... Okay, so there's a, there's a few things on the Keppel side that should be in the... Uh, I haven't got it into the release branch yet, but whenever it does, then the quick release release after that. Um, we have... Some fixes around FBOs. So you, when you do an FBO clear now, is the uh, it's interesting because it's that way around. Clear FBO, you pass in an FBO, and now you can also pass in which attachment. So if you have some FBO, um, you can then specify like attachment zero, attachment three, and the depth buffer, and it will clear specifically those. It'll bind that FBO, clear those, unbind again. Um, well, depending on, depending on what it needs doing there. Then you also have um, clear attachments, which is very similar, of, except for the fact um, that you only need to specify the attachments. It will clear what it, um, the attachments of the currently bound FBO. Um, and then the last thing is when you're doing, um, let's have a look here. Oh, it's just right here, actually. When you're doing with, with FBO bound to bind an FBO, so, so some FBO here, you can also specify, I'm going to bring this down to the next line for reasons. Um, you can also specify the draw buffers. And this you put in color attachments. And here you can specify a pattern as well. And this lets you say, okay, in a lot of our um, GPU code, like we have fragment shaders, let's say, well, this is one, but it doesn't have multiple outputs. Do we have one with multiple outputs? Of course we do, yes, for our G-buffer stage. We have here three outputs. The first one is going to be GL position, so that's taken. But the other two are going to be written to the first two FBO attachments by default. Now, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you have a FBO with a ton of attachments and you've got four different pipelines and each pipeline is going to write to a different set of attachments. This draw buffer um, attachments thing here is what you can use. You can then specify, okay, I want attachment three and attachment four, and it will write just to those. And then whatever you render in here is going into these attachments. So if we put a call to this pipeline, where whichever pipeline uses this, frag stage. Okay, so yeah, we ran the thing pipeline. The outputs from here would end up in attachment three and four. So I've done a lot of work with that and um, that is in I'm trying to think of anything else oh yes actually there is uh, there is one more it's with um, I can't remember which it is is it whoops right I'm gonna have to find out Kevin read me I know it's in the change log there we go with outputs to attachments there we go so we can do with outputs to attachments. And it is roughly equivalent to this. So what it, what it means is, hey, we've already got an FBO bound, but we want to change which color attachments are being written into. So this allows you to do that. So it's very much like that draw buffer thing on with FBO bound, except you do it to the FBO that's already bound within that scope. And then when you leave the scope, it'll reset back to what it was. So that's that. Um, recap over. We're going to dive into this real soon. I'm just going to check the chat and see what's going on because there's some lovely folks here. Uh, what has been happening? 
<laughs> it's my favorite bracket stream. Welcome. Um, Pong the Pimp's trying to ban people. You are not getting mod rights. Um, <laughs> uh, no prologue on this one. That would be cool, though. Um, all the hellos, and then... Dara's saying, I have been lurking on list games and saw that you're working into nuclear. Any info? Yes, I was... Um, to be honest, I was just playing with that stuff again. I've, I've made some progress. I got something working, but um, I'm having some problems where the geometry looks wrong. <laughs> There's like, I get the window up, but when I minimize it, it's clear that the tr wrong triangles are being drawn. So I fucked up there somewhere. I'm not sure what it is yet. I will dig back into that when I've got the energy. It's kind of on the back burner. Um, but it would be really good to get some UI back in this again. It's been a long time. Um... All right, so let's dive back into what we were doing last week. We were working on screen space ambient occlusion from this site. I'll copy it into the chat for those who haven't been here for the other episodes or want to follow along today. Um, we've actually got quite far already. So we have done the meaty bit, which is we have drawn in our first pass screen space positions, screen space normals, and albedo. So what you're seeing here are the screen space normals. If I switch through, let's go back to play with verts here. Um, and we're in, let's go down to draw text, which is in our main loop. And see here we're, we're, we're displaying, um, using this helper function here, draw texture, which just draws texture to the screen. Um, and we're pulling one of the things out of our G buffer. So this is the normals. Uh, we have the albedo sampler. So this is just without any lighting or anything. This is what the place looks like. You can see everything here. The colors look a little bit strange, of course, because um, they have been treated for gamma. So we've, um, yes, we've already raised that to the power we needed to. Um, and then the last thing we did, um, we've got the, what was the last thing that's in that G buffer? Let's just go and have a look because I can't remember. Oh yeah, positions, of course. Um, so we can do the position sampler. These are positions, obviously, because they're floating point values and our colors can only represent from zero to one, anything greater than one like is saturating. So all these areas here do actually have detail, um, but we just can't display it with a color. What we could do is scale this down. I think actually, you know what? I think draw text might have a scale value. Yes, there's one down here, scale. Uh, oh no, that's I'm an idiot. That's for the shape, Ooh, in the shape here. That scales that window. I don't, have we got anything to multiply the color by? Color scale, there it is. I'm up. So if we do, let's go smaller than that. So we just, hard to see, but there's a little more obvious that there is more detail down here. You might be able to see. Yeah, there you can go. You can see the outline there. So yes, we're dealing with positions. So we've got those. That was this bit. We've written all those out. And then we had some, what do we have here? We had kernel samples and rotation vectors that were both being pushed into here. So let's go and see what we did for that. Now in um, map G, so these are the samples, the hemi samples. It's a UBO, let's just pull that and see what we've got. We have a bunch of positions. I know I've shrunk that down so it's hard to read, but there's not much to read there anyway. A load of vector threes within a unit hemisphere, uh, which will then be rotating. And we also passed in a noise texture. So let's have a look at that. Let's bring that this back up. Let's go down to, oh yeah, our draw text is here. Um, let's just do another one. Draw text. Up. We have some random numbers in a texture and um, we're using those for rotations. We tile this across the screen if I remember correctly. So we will go and look at that in a minute. Um, and eventually theirs is black and white, but ours is uh, drawing red because we're just using one color component of our buffer. Um, it's very hard to see on the stream. I know the colors are all out of whack on the, the stream right now. I need to work with OBS. It's my capture device I'm pretty sure is giving me the wrong colors, and then I'm just going to have to correct it with OBS. Um, it's rather annoying. Um, 
what's the best way of showing that? If I go to render and I just raise the result to a power, um, then yeah, the small numbers are going to get smaller and we're going to be pushing values towards zero and one. So let's just, let's do this. Um, let's just raise it to the power of 10 and you'll be able to see that we have some information in here. This is our um, shadow information that we've been, our occlusion information rather that we've been calculating. So we've got up to this stage. You'll see there is a really, well, I'm not sure how well it shows up on, on the stream, but there is a very fine grid over everything. And that's because of the tiling of our um, of our random pattern uh, that we're using for rotations. It's giving this, this artifact. So according to the tutorial, uh, to remove that, we then have to do a blur. So we are going to go down to the point where we do a blur. Um, the bit I don't remember, though, is we pushed in these rotations. I know we put this noise in. What did we do with it? Oh, no, that we calculated our hemisphere based on that as well um, in this part. When we were cra calculating this matrix, the tangent by tangent normal matrix, yes, we were using, we we're using the samples here. Hmm. I can't remember where our random numbers came into this. Oh, there it is, random back. Random back minus normal. Never mind. And there's random back up here. Yes, random back minus normal times the dot product of random back and normal. Yep, that's where we're using it. Okay, so not going to worry about what that was now. We've got to get on with the blur. So even though I would advise opening that link um, on your machines, because this is all washed out, but if you do scroll to this part of the document, you'll see that they have a result which looks a lot better than ours does. So I have a feeling, so this is the bit where we were chatting about at the end of the last stream and couldn't quite work out. They have their occlusion information, just like we do. So if I zoom in here, it's actually quite easy to see that we've got some nice occlusion information. That looks great, actually. Um, but ours is darker in general. And it almost makes me feel like we've got the hemispheres oriented in the wrong way, um, which could mean that our normals are incorrect in some way. Not sure what that is yet. We'll need to look into it, um, and we will. But anyway, we can see from their picture that they also have this pattern, so then they started talking about blurring it. So let's start from here. As we can see, ambient occlusion gives a great sense of depth, apparently. Um, with just the ambient occlusion texture, we can already clearly see the model is indeed laying on the floor instead of hovering slightly above it. It still doesn't look perfect, as the repeating pattern of the noise texture is clearly visible. To create a smooth ambient occlusion result, we need to blur the ambient occlusion texture. So... Between the SSAO path and the lighting pass, uh, we first want to blur the SSAO texture, so let's create yet another frame buffer uh, for storing the blur results. So I'm going to just copy this so we can see what they've got in there. Uh... Come on now. What they've got in their code, and we will make the equivalent. So we're going to be doing a make FBO. And we've got to work out what we're doing. There is, they're making FBO here. They're binding the frame buffer because they have to do that there. They're generating some textures and binding that. So, and then doing some setup. So it looks like we only need this. They don't mention depth. So I'm not sure if we, I don't think we're going to need depth because all we're doing is a blur. So we're just doing some image processing stuff. And then down here, they're talking about the sampling of the texture. So I think we just need to do make FBO like this. So we're going to say let FBO is make FBO. And then we are going to get the, um, let's do this actually. Do, do, do. The sampler is going to be, we're going to sample. And we're going to sample the very first, the texture in the first attachment. So then we're just going to do attachment, texture, of FBO and zero. So that's going to take, we've created an FBO with one color attachment. We're grabbing that color attachment, grabbing the texture out of it. Um, oh, it's, oh no, that's, that is great. We're sampling that texture. Oh yeah, we need to set some parameters on this because normally they're 
Um, minify and magnify is, well, the minify is linear, mitmap linear. So we need to just say nearest in both these cases. So let's do minify filter is nearest, and I will be along to the chat in just a second. The magnify filter is nearest. And I think that's all we need to do. So this is our version of all of this. We can get rid of that. We're gonna to need to go and shove this code with all the rest of the stuff that we do for setup. So we're gonna go back to play with verts. We're gonna to go to reset FBOs, which is a function down here. We're gonna set ourselves up a um, some variables. So we need, what, what is this for? This is the blur FBO and blur sampler. Let's just go and make some variables up here for that. Um, Blur FBO and Blur Sampler. And um, yeah, here we go. Actually, we don't need much of any of this, actually, do we? Oop, get rid of that. I seem to have mucked up some bits, but no, we're fine now. Oh no, I have. No, no, this is correct. It's all right. Thought I screwed up some friends when I was copy pasting that, but we are fine. Let's see what's going on here. Bug number 13, what have you done with the colors? It's fine. These colors look fine. What do you think they should be? <laughs> Gab abomination, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's really annoying. Um, I, I replaced the machine and now the settings have, have changed. So I need to I need to see what's going on. I did do some stuff before, like trying to correct the gamma, but I never got it to be like a decent representation of what I have on this machine over here, the one I'm working on. And I'm not sure what the deal with that is. So I've just got to take some hours and do it, but it's not very fun. Um, so yeah, well, let's go set. And we are going to be doing the blur FBO is going to be this set F the blur sampler to be this and that's not going to be it's going to be blur fbo we're going to go when there is a blur fbo that means we've already set this up once before so we will free the blur fbo and we will free the um well we'll free a bunch of stuff actually we're going to free the um attachment the attached texture from the blur fbo we're going to free the sampler. Um, what's that? Blur sampler. All right. Okay. My brain's just about keeping it together. We just had a release um, of Tailspire, the, uh, an update to the alpha, uh, just, uh, what, like an hour or two ago, Max? So it's uh, it's been busy. Um, what's going on? Are you using Linux? I am indeed. Yes, I'm using, um, I think it's Ubuntu on this machine with uh, Stump Window Manager on top. Um, yes, I have, a, I have a little Windows box down here I use for streaming because there aren't drivers for that stuff and I had it from work. So yes, it's the way of the world, unfortunately. Right, okay. Okay, so we've made that um, that thing. Okay, because the tiled random vector the tiled random vector texture gives us consistent randomness, we can use this property to our advantage to create a very simple blur shader. So this is the shader we need to copy. Um, and we are going to do that. So let's go and one thing I wanted to see actually, I'm just gonna leave that there for a second. Let's comment it out. Boop. And just for my own mental comfort, let's do that. Um, Where's that random vec? Yeah, there it is. What does that look like? I want to do this. Doesn't look great, does it? <laughs> um, Antwerp Games, hello. I want to have a look at these values again at some point and just make sure that they are sound.
but anyway, for now we'll we'll go with it. It's it was looking roughly like what we'd expect, so we'll, we'll, we can come back to that. Plenty of time to play. Okay, so we need to remake this uh, shader. So we're going to do a deform G. It's going to be the blur fragment shader. Um, we are going to be passing in a. Well, we're going to be passing in some UV, uh, some text coordinates. I've really got to get in the happy the, the habit of saying text chords. Um, so let's try and do that. Um, there is a uniform that we're going to be passing in, and this is going to be the SSAO. Um, well, they call it SSAO input, so let's do the same. It's a sampler 2D. Um, what else? We don't need. Right, so we've done that, 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 that. And then we have to um, do some this. Let's just get a little let set up. Texel size is 1 divided by um, a vector 2, um, which is the texture size. I guess this is a, um... oh, I love having help. Right, it is a GLSL function. So, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna make this slightly smaller so I can read it well. Uh, texture size, retrieve the dimensions of a level of a texture. So that's fine, yep. It takes a sampler and a level of detail. We've only got one, so that'll be fine. Returns the dimensions of a level um, of level LOD. The components in the return value are filled in in order with the width, height, and depth of the texture from the array forms, blah, 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 blah. So that is that. Okay, that's cool. So we're getting the texture size of SAO inputs at zero. We're getting, um, so it's setting up a result to zero. So we're now gonna be doing a simple loop here. Hey, if anyone's got some ideas of how to compile of like, what is the subset of the loop macro that we could support in GLSL? That's a really interesting one. Um, Antwerp Games is saying, I like the audio quality. Thanks, man. That's really good to know. It's a, this is a little Samson CO1U microphone, little USB thing. Had it for absolutely ages. It's my partner's and it's just solid. And yeah, that's it. I think it was, I think it's about like seven, well, it was 70 bucks a long time ago. So it's uh, probably better now. Okay, so we're setting X to be minus two. Um, we're looping until X is less than two. And we're doing um, ink that. And then we're doing another loop for y is minus two. It's just so uncomfortable to write these style of loops in this language. In, in like my head doesn't like it. Um, so I, I really would like a more Lisp appropriate loop structure. Um, okay, so we're in there. And we're gonna make a little let. For this offset, it's a vec2, um, which is an, a float of x and a, um, wait a second, okay, yeah, so we just do, I think these are made into floats anyway, I think my thing auto casts those. So that's fine. We'll look at the source code that's generated just to find out in a second. Um, so we're gonna multiply those by texel size. Um, and then when that's done, um, we are going to do, what are we doing? Oh yeah, we're just adding it to the result. So increment the result um, by, we're gonna sample the texture, SSAO input, at text chords plus offset. So there is, a, yeah, of course, that's the offset we like. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna call this uh, TC up here. TV? No, TC. All right. And then the, re the result is result divided by 
Four by four. Okay. I think that's that. What didn't it like? Okay, so there is no applicable method for the GLSL function vec2 when called with an argument tabled i vec2. So from vec2 texture size SSAO input. I guess I don't support that then. Wait a second, that's rather strange. Oh yeah, IVEC2, now that makes sense. All right, okay, so that is something that we need to add at some point. So, um, yes. Text size is this, and then we're gonna go and do X of text size, Y of text size. Hopefully, we'll get to the next bug. Offset is undefined. Of course, because this needs to be a let star. Okay, th this, it, because it doesn't know, remember that GPU functions could run on any, like could just be a standalone function or they could be a particular stage. So when we compile and there's a problem, Vario is gonna try and be forgiving. It's gonna look through to find if there's any stage where this would make sense. Um, and if not, it'll report errors kind of grouped together for all of them. So apparently, because we know this is meant to be a fragment, we want to look here. Currently, Vario cannot handle changing the type through an assignment due to the static nature of GLSL. Yes, the result is meant to be... Okay, so increment result. Um, yes, we're missing something here. Yes, we're meant to have got the first component out of it. X, there we go. And that is that. Okay, that compiles now. Um, let's bring up the REPL again. And do a pull G on blur frag of VEC2. Okay, so this is the GLSL we've generated. And we can see we were interested in whether this was going to change the X and Y into floats. And we can see that it just modifies something so it settles down. Float X, float Y. And same is done up here. So we we are getting what we need. I should really add something like destructuring bind for vectors as well. That'd be quite nice to do, just to bind the components out. I'm not sure if I've done that yet, but uh, I'll have a look at it. So let's see what's been going on in chat, because you guys have been nattering, and I love it. Okay. Uh, free the attachments. Absolutely. Um, da -da -da. A lot of streamers do worse with $500 mics. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm not doing anything that special, so it doesn't make sense to, to get anything uh, crazy. The only other thing I do is, like, I'm talking out to here, and so rather than talking into the microphone where you might get popping and you might want to pop shield in more, some more of those advanced things, I just point the mic to my face. Like, point my mic to where the sound is rather than directing the sound at the mic. It, works well enough and eats up a lot of the uh, other artifacts. Um, <laughs> Baggers can't be insane. Right, you can spend a lot of money on audio equipment. Yeah, it gets expensive fast. My, my, a bunch of my mates are kind of music producing and type guys and they have a lot of gear. It's really cool. Again, a completely different league and different interests. So it's, yeah. Um... Elevator says, quite happy with the Zoom H2N. I'll look into that. That's cool. Median saying there's a plus plus X in the original GLSL, but a plus equals... Yep. That's fine though, isn't it? Same deal. Plus plus versus... Oh yeah, you're saying it's a post fix, uh, post edition. Is that going to be a problem for us? I'm not sure if I've got plus plus here. Apparently I do. Oops. There you go. <laughs> All is well. 
All right, let's keep going. So let's just actually, before we go any further, I want to make sure I understand what's going on. Um, we're taking the input, this is this. We are calculating the, sorry, we're, we're taking the texture size of this thing. Yep, we're doing one over that, which is giving us a texel size, which is great. Um, we are then iterating for a four by four grid, um, accumulating some information. Um, yeah, we just work out our offset which is just, yes, the texture coordinate where we are plus the little offset, this number of texels we're walking around. And that's it. We just sample the original texture there and we add it to the result. And then obviously we have to divide it by the number of samples we've taken to average that down. That gives us what should be a blur. Um, we've already got this set up. Um, I'm going to rename this. Let's change SSAO vert to quad vert. And because that's really what it is. And then down here, we can use quad vert again. And we're going to go use blur frag for our blur pipeline. And that is not quite right. I couldn't find a function called quad vert. Oh, did I not? Did I not compile that? Stupid boy, Pike. Right, let's do that. A comma's not in the back quote. Where are you? Oh. Clumsy typing. Nothing new there. Okay, so we've got our little blur pipeline. Our code is written. Um, and I guess they just, yeah, they, they assume we know how to do that. So let's go do it. Um, we're going to go with play with verts again. We're going to go down to where we're doing that draw text stuff. So here we did the SSAO part. Um, now we're going to do with FBO bound, we are going to have the blur FBO. Um, oh, itchy eye. We are going to map G, which is how we do our rendering. We map over a pipeline. We're mapping a stream of vertices over that pipeline, which is a GPU buffer. And we are passing in one um, uniform, which I can't remember what it was. It was called SSAO inputs. There we go. SSAO input. Um, and it is going to take the output of this. So we were writing into SSAO FBO. Um, I think it's SSAO. SSAO sampler is the thing. Yes, this, this. So it's this one. Um, so we are then going to take that and we are going to write into it. So it's freaking out. What's it saying? It's saying that nil is not a type FBO. Oh, we haven't actually initialized those yet. Then let's do that now. Um, blur FBO. Let's just take this code and go into the REPL. Write a program and dump it in, hit return, and we're done. And then just say, yeah, try again. And that's fine. Now we're running. Now we're cooking with gas. And we are going to go back here. And instead of drawing the SSAO sampler, we are going to draw the blur sampler. And that, I'm not sure if that shows up on the stream at all. That is less blurry for me. So that was the original. That's that. That's probably no difference at all on there. Uh, Antwerp Games is saying better head off and run some errands. Oh, good. thanks for stopping by, though. Um, I'll catch you another week. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we're not using the... Oh, we were using the value X, weren't we? We'll see. Ah, oh, my, my brain's falling out, my man. So you tell me. Okay, so we've got now our smoothed output. So now I'm not seeing any artifacts here. It's actually looking pretty good. Um, okay, I'm just wondering. I wonder if it's just, just the red color that makes it hard to, hard to see what's going on. Oh, it's interesting. I just realized our blur sampler... Um, when we created it, we didn't tell it what kind of um, texture to produce. So when we got 
Let's have a look. There's our blur sampler. Um, if we get the sampler texture and uh, we do element type on that, we can see it's an RGBA8. So what we could do, I want to just see, because I think that I'm just wondering if this is a human eye thing. So if I do VEC4 of the result, oh no, it's still pretty hard to see. Um, I will, it's a little bit better though. I'm going to raise this to a power again just for a couple of seconds so you can see what I'm seeing. Yeah, so something like that. So we are getting, this is our ambient occlusion. In our cracks, we get darker areas. This is all done in screen space. There's a few little passes. It's really impressive. I'm seeing some banding, which I do not like. I wonder what that is. I'm sure we'll find out later. I'm sure it's nothing that some blue noise can soak up. But whatever. Let's um, not worry about that for now. Let's bring this back. Okay, so that's my that's my result. Very happy with that. I'm gonna leave it like this because I think it's oh no. <laughs> I was gonna say it was easier to look at, but it's not really easier for you guys. Let's try and find an area which is more pleasant to, to look at. Like about that. Is that showing up? Yeah, that looks like it might be showing up. Cool. So we've done our blur. What happens now? Applying the ambient occlusion. Okay, applying the ambient occlusion factors, the lighting equation is incredibly easy. All we have to do is multiply the per fragment ambient occlusion factors with the lighting's ambient component, and we are done. If we take the um, Blin Fong deferred lighting shader, our previous tutorial, yada, yada, yada. So this is where they're redoing their own thing. Now it's on us. We need to kind of go and resurrect what we had before, because I think I destroyed most of what we had. Um, but luckily, I had a file called old render. Well, we had a bunch of stuff in here. So um, we've still got all this stuff, the calculating lighting and all that kind of thing. Um, and the normal from map. So that's fine. We've done that. Um, we've got things in slightly different spaces this time, though. So it's going to be interesting to see what we do here. So we really want to do our lighting stage now, which would have been this. So instead of pulling these things out from the albedo sampler and the normal map and things like this, we're going to be um, pulling them out of textures. And we won't need to do this stuff, calculating the, um, yeah, the tangent by tangent matrix and all that kind of stuff. We don't need to do our kind of normal calculations here. Do, 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 do. what else? Um, oh, I just remembered something. When we passed our normals down from various places, so here's a vertex stage where we Oh, no, we normalize that. Is there any anything here? We do have a view normal that's passed over to the fragment stage. Do we normalize it? Good. Oh, no, we just ignore it. <laughs> We're not actually using it for anything. Okay. Um, and the thing we are getting from the normal map we're normalizing as well. So that's all right. Never mind, then forget that. Um, Yes, right, what do we do now? Um, that's interesting actually, when you pass matrices down um, across from vertex to fragment stages, is the interpolation, like, like, no, I guess it doesn't interpolate matrix, well, what does it do with matrix values that are passed over there? How does the interpolation work? And because this is like, is describing a kind of base matrix, does that mean we should be normalizing the, um, the columns again? Not sure about this. Okay, so what are we doing? Um, yes, we've got to reconstruct all this. So I think what we need to do is just have a shader which does this lighting stuff. So for every, we're going to need to take the light. We're going to need to get the light into view space. 
um, because all our positions and things like this are in view space now. And then we'll have to run these calculations as before and produce a final amount. And then this ambient quantity that's here, that's what we're going to multiply by our SSAO. So let's just take this and see if we can um, do something with it. So let's drop it down here. Um, we'll call it the compose stage. Class of Ethanol says, hey -o! hello, good to have you here. Um, let's see what's going on. Okay. All right, so we're going to be doing a full screen quad. Um, so what we'll be getting from there will be some texture coordinates, and that's about it. Text chords. Uh, we'll get rid of this stuff. And then we are going to pass in the things from our gbuffer. So let's go and find the gbuffer. It's a position sampler, an albedo sampler, and a normal sampler. Let's do those. We're just going to call them Sam. Um, these will be sampler 2D. Let's keep time, let's keep the lights, we'll need those. And mult, I don't know what I was using that for, but we'll keep it for now. It seems to be used as some kind of flag. Um, Go on, ethanol. What's up? Um, okay, so we are going to start unpacking this stuff. That's the first thing we need to do. So let's just do texture chords with um, norm sam. So we're going to do position, normal, and albedo. And we've already gamma corrected our albedo in an earlier stage, so we don't need to do that. We're just going to read it out and go with it. Um, we are going to, what are we going to do? We've got ambient factor there, which is cool. So we're going to take our ambient. Oh yeah, that's another thing we're going to need. We're going to need our SSAO, uh, Screen Surface Ambient Occlusion Sampler, which is a sampler 2D. So we're also going to, oops, occlusion is texture. Why have I normalized those other ones? That's stupid. Uh, text cores, that's what I get for copy pasting stuff. Um, that one we need to normalize, that one we really shouldn't, and that one we really shouldn't. Um, we're taking our occlusion factor, we're reading that out, um, then we're multiplying the occlusion, uh, well, the ambient by the occlusion, that just reads a little better that way, and we're turning it into a VEC3, which we're going to apply. Um, Class of Ethanol says, do you think Commonless will make a good choice to make games like Super Meat Boy, The Binding of Isaac, or Braid, or is it, uh, sorry, are they, is the available libraries too dull and lacking. So I wouldn't say dull so much, because but I think the big thing that's always missing is the content pipeline. It's like you've got to work with other people and you've got to work with their tools. And that's one area where again, like a language on its own, like that's cool, that's gonna help the programmer. And like if if you're very effective in that language, that's great. And if you're a sole programmer, awesome. If you're working with other programmers, well, you really need to be working in something that like meets in the middle, unless there's some really good reason not to be. Um, Lisp isn't just magically better. Um, it's a cool language, but it also has its downsides as well. Uh, what we're doing is fairly ridiculous, but you know, it's kind of cool. Um, I'm very interested in, like this is the thing, but my, my position on this really comes from, I'm interested in like, Rather than having everything in a in the in the kind of fast language and then the scripting language bolting on top, what would it be like if everything's in the same environment and the scripting can kind of pervade? Um, like 
Commonless makes for a very, very nice dynamic language. It's still harder to do a lot of the th like to do some of the kinds of control that I would like for lower level stuff, but that's that's where my interest really lies. Is like how far can you go with this stuff? Like what levels of control are required? Um, I like the user experience of programming, um, and I mean that is not just in common list, but I like I'm interested in the area of research that is programmer user experience. Um, as I was saying, well, I know Tailspire is written in what I think is Unity, so I wanted to know this opinion. Yeah, of course. So Tailspire, that's a perfect example, right? So Tailspire, um, we're a team of three. Um, one, like, primarily artist musician that does some kind of script, some scripting stuff. One, who's incredibly technical uh, lead artist. So he's fantastic. Dude has, like, 13 years of experience with Unity. If I say Common Lisp, that means I throw away 13 years of experience. For what? A and obviously the engine. And Unity has a great content pipeline. Like, we can get assets in really easily. It works with a lot of stuff. So, it's yeah, it's really going to be on you and what you need. It's really hard to make the case that, like, Lisp in itself, like, is not is not a game engine, right? It's You have a component of something that you might want in a game engine, right? Um... But I love it, man. Like, I mean, like, I, I don't want to be down and play. I think it's a fucking great language. It is the when I when I code, I like coding in this place. It's a, a really nice experience for me, and it has a lot of benefits in that regard. And yeah, I miss it when I'm writing Telspy. Like, I don't want I like C C sharp is the best example of those that class of languages of like the Java ish languages. Um, and it's developing, you know, there's some really good aspects about it. And Unity itself has some great technology. So, well, it is great technology. It's really impressive stuff in there if you know how to use it. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that will probably be my opinion. It's really, yeah, it really depends, man. But, no, yeah, like I wouldn't just, I wouldn't go up to someone on the street and go, hey, you're making a game? You should do it in Common Lisp. Like, nah. Darius is saying love is a neat library to do 2D stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I think some guys used it for the game jam with Fennel, which is a list that can pass to Lua. Yeah, I saw that. There were like two, two or three entries that were doing that. That was really cool. I think that's great. Um, we've got some, like, we played with some 2D physics libraries as well. Like, if you spend the time to make yourself a little engine, if, like, if... Like, if you were doing this in your part-time while working a job, you know, like, and you made yourself an engine that you were very effective in, and you know how to get the content and in all this kind of stuff, and you made that experience pleasant for if you're, like, a sole developer, or if it's you and an artist, and the artist likes the experience, then you could be, then it could be great, you know? But then the problem is, how are you going to get what devices you want to target? Because, like, yeah, um, that's an issue. I've seen ECL game ships using ECL on Android. Um, I don't like ECL's performance, so I wouldn't want to use it. I haven't seen SBCL stuff shipping. Like I, I've seen people get, get builds on Android. I haven't seen any games or final software for Android written in SB with using SBCL cell. So I'm yeah not sure about that. You mentioned you prefer writing common list. What's your opinion on Scheme? Um, I'm interested in the macro system and uh, not much else. Um, it's too, like, I would need, I don't know, I, I would have to look for something. It would be an academic interest. Like, I'm interested in Haskell because of their type system. I don't have any desire to write big software in Haskell. And it's the same for Scheme for me. Um, but that's partially because I've already got my fill of what I need from Common Lisp. And also, yeah, common list goes. I can make common list go faster than Scheme seems to be able to be made to in general. Right, like you pick something like. I don't know. Racket is probably the most interesting because of their language stuff it is amazingly cool, but I wouldn't want to do Kepler in it. Um, right. Where do we get to? Oh yes, we're gonna do. We're fixing up this, aren't we? So we've got our ambient, we've got our diffuse power. Um, we're not using now anywhere, so let's remove that. And we're not fucking with that normal just now. Let's just go with this and see where we go. I'm 
just going to go back to the old render again and see what the where P lights came from. Okay, that's from a set of oh yeah, this is it, the light set here, of course. So we take the lights, we use with slots on them to get P lights and count out, of course, yeah. Then we do times count, we increment the diffuse power by whatever the contribution of the light is. Um, a ref P light P lights. Ah yeah, we're getting the light. We calculate the lights given the position and the normal. And Yes, so the only thing we have to do now is the fact that, so let's grab this. Oops, let's light be this. Let's just see if this compiles. Oh, well, let's finish off writing. So we've got light amount is ambient plus diffuse power. Um, and then we do light amount times the albedo which gives us, yeah, our final color, and then, oh, sorry, yeah, gives us the color, and then we call prep final color, which does the tone mapping, which also does the gamma correction, and then we populate the last element with this kind of luma, and we're doing that because the next stage is going to be the, um, it's gone out of my head. What is the next stage? Um, the next stage is going to be uh, F, Yes, the uh, anti-aliasing, FXAA. Um, and that requires the Luma value to be here. So that's what we're doing. Let's compile that and see what it complains about. Um, there is a texture norm sampler thing going on here and the texture chords are apparently a VEC3. Oh, that's just a typo on my part. So let's uh, change that and then it compiles, that's fine. Um, we're going to have a compose pipeline here. Oops. Compose pipeline, which is going to take the quadvert and pass it into the compose stage. Um, I'm going to just call this compose frag instead. Compose frag. It's just to remind me that it's a fragment stage. It's not required. Um, there are no special namings required for different stages. It's just a habit I've got into. Okay, so with that done, um, we've got a couple of things to do. So let's go back to play with verts. Uh, let's bring on the REPL. And I want to know, can we get the current... No, okay, so can we get the... Is there a... No, okay. I just was interested if you could tell what the blending params were. So let's um, go down into wherever we're drawing stuff, we need to go with uh, blending. Can we just, if we specify with blending to be nil, hopefully that turns blending off. Let's see what happens. With blending nil, set current blending params. Yes, if params are not true, then it's going to do a GL disable on blend. Cool. So within this scope, blending is going to be disabled. Um, what now? So then we're going to do a map G. Let's bring up the, the render file again because I want to see what the arguments are because I've got a terrible memory. We're going to map G over the compose pipeline. Um, we are going to pass in the same quad we've been using each time. In fact, why are we doing this like this. Let's go up here. Quad stream. Doot. I mean, we could even move it outside the loop, but it's not hurting us that much. So get quad stream. And down here, we're rendering the quad stream. Fine. And we've got Oh, let's just go and get them ourselves. So we've got all of these. Do, 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 do. Oh, Malt is just some arguments passed in? Okay. We were just using it as some random flag. So let's remove Malt. And grab these again. 
Okay, so then we're going to come here. Oh, if the person that emailed me asking about um, uh, Emacs kind of key bindings and things like this, I'm really sorry I haven't got back to you. <laughs> I will do that eventually. Uh, I've been pretty piss poor at that. Okay, so. Um, once again, what do we need? Let's grab things from the G buffer. We're going to pass in the position sampler. We're going to pass in the albedo sampler. We're going to pass in the normal sampler. We've got the SSAO sampler. We've got now, which is just the time. Um, and we have lights. And I don't know what they are. So let's have a look. Reset lights. Apparently, there is a lights variable. Let's go and have a look at that. Yep, it's a UBO, which is a light set. Let's pull that. It's pre allocated a large number of lights, but most of this looks like garbage, so I expect it is. And But these three at the top, these look interesting. Let's just get rid of all this. And you can actually see here that it pulls back the number three as well, which tells us how many lights there actually are, which are these three here. So this will be a position and a, probably a direction and a power. So that definitely looks like the variable we're meant to be. Sorry, I realized that I was I had this text set very small. Sorry about that. Um, lights, I expect is that. Uh, if I compile this, what happens? No function named text chords was found in this environment. Okay, so if we go back to render, it sounds like I've copped up something there. Text chords, right there, there we go. Yes, instead of writing texture, I wrote text chords. Ah, oh, come on, there is no applicable method for JLSON VEC3 when cool with argument types of VEC4. Um, oh, of course, so our occlusion factor is, um, currently a VEC4, so let's just bring it down to a VEC3. Um, and we'll abort that and we'll continue. Oh, there's still an issue here. No applicable method for the GLSA function VEC3 when called with argument types VEC3. Okay, yes, that is apparently not done. That's fine. Um, and then we've still got some issues. Oh, God damn it, Chris, stop jumping around. Um, no applicable method for the GLSL function calc light when call with the functions vec4, vec4, and plight. So what does that function take? It takes a vec3, a vec3, and a plight. Okay, so once again, we need to fix these up here. Swizzle, man, I am flagging. Get rid of that. Compile again. It's not happy with albedo. This is a VEC4 and a VEC3. Let's do exactly the same then. Let's take this, swizzle, XYZ. No complaints this time. Continue and it's running. So that is us back doing something. We still have not sorted out the light position though. We got to here, but we haven't done what we need to do with it. Let's have a look what's going on. Um, oh, thanks for the compliment on Tail Spire. It's, it's fun to make. Uh, it's just right. It's brain, brain fuck interpreters make me so unhappy. This is the least interesting thing I can think of. Not to disrespect that if you get a kick out of it, that's wicked. I do not. Um... Yeah, so of course, yeah, Naughty Dog did Jack and Daxter using a Lisp. Uh, the Uncharted games were still using Lisp scripting. They still use Scheme in parts of their tooling for sure. Um, or at least they were as of a couple of years ago. Um, I can't remember what other details they had regarding their Lisp stuff now. Um, but again, they've got an experienced team that know what they want and they use, they use that stuff pretty heavily. 
Um, it's very cool. So they're, they're still very much, again, it's, it is, it's one of those places where they have solved, they have their content pipeline outside of a lot of stuff and they've already sorted that. They have something that works for them and they've got the people on board as well with that kind of thing. So they've, they've hit those parts where they don't have to worry about it. And they're not, again, I'm, I can't remember if any of the gameplay scripting was still done in Scheme. I think there might be a little, and I can't remember the details. But they, they again, hefty macro users over there. It's good. Terrace is saying, I find it quite inspiring because when most people say something along the lines of when you do game development, you have to use C++. Totally. While well, this shows that you do what you love to do. Absolutely. There's, if, if, as long as you're honest with yourself about what your targets are, where you're shipping and all those kind of things, and you work to that, there's, you can make it whatever you like. I mean, people, there's, there's a guy that ships games in QBasic. There's people that write the whole thing like Roller Coast, Coast Tycoon and Assembly. Like, it's possible. Like, and I, I think there's loads more... Like the, the reason I'm doing the table stuff and all that data processing thing is I'm interested, like, hey, if you take a large chunk of your data processing work, get that inside a DSL where it's really fast. Like how much does that free up? Does that buy me enough? Does that get me into a place where I can do a different kind of game in Lisp? And it's, again, I, I'm not attached to, like we can have 10 different languages. It's the boundaries between languages and the environment that the languages are in that's important. But yeah, it's me ranting away as usual. Um, <laughs> ask a programmer to write software or spend six months creating tools to build the software. Six months? That was nice and fast. <laughs> What's careful now? Like, it's been around a long time. Oh, uh, Jesus. But very true. Very true. So we need, what are our lights? Our lights are in world space, right? And we need to get them into view space, um, which is fine. There is a world to view matrix. Um, let's see how we do that. So what is the type of light? P light, it's got a position, a color, and a strength. Oh, it was color, okay. So, uh, fixed is make P light position um, what should we do actually? How, how should we really do this? Um, let's do with slots again. Nah, that's not good. Um, P light pass light there. Color strength. Compile that. What doesn't it like? Can't guess a suitable type for POS. Really? That's really interesting. Where did you get that from? Oh, wait, what? This one? That doesn't seem right. It's got to be related to this, surely. Um... This looks like a bug. Can't guess a suitable type for POS. But it's a VEC3. Or is it because this freaks out? Oh, right, of course. So it's freaking out because, uh, yeah, this is just a case of a really bad error. So for some reason, I think it's looking at this and is going, 
Right, it's looking at this and going, hey, this might be injected, this might be an implicit uniform. So we have to just assume a type for now, that makes sense. Um, that's polluted this whole expression and now it doesn't know what to use for a type for here. So what I need to do is I need to add worldview, which is a matrix four. Compile this, and it still says it can't get a suitable type for pos. That's odd. I mean, p-like position is um, a vec3, so we know this is wrong, you know? Um, I'm just going to split this up. I just want to see where the error actually happens. So lpos, tlpos. I'll do tlpos here. Because again, we can't. OK, so now we're getting the error that I expected, which is the yeah, you can't transform this by this. And that is fine. Um, so we are going to take this and make it into a like a position. And then this needs to be a vector three again. So we will swizzle it back down. X, Y, Z. Can't guess a suitable type of pos. That is so interesting. Oh, wait, is this? Oh, I know what this might be. I think the constructors for the, that's it. The constructors for the vectors in um, in Vario don't take keyword arguments because you don't support keyword arguments in Vario. And that means they're just passed in like boa constructor style. But so then it was looking at that keyword and getting freaked out. The stupid thing was, let's just do this for a second. Put pass back in. Oh no, it was showing it as a keyword. Oh, I was just not reading this properly. That is interesting. Okay. I should probably actually have an error which kind of goes, hey, if you're if we see a keyword, it's probably that they've cocked up and think that they can use keyword arguments. We should give a better argument for that, like better error, like suggesting maybe you're trying to do this. Okay, so. Well, with all that done, actually, I'm going to leave it like this. So that's fine. So now this, uh, <laughs> fuck you, of course. Uh, I've still left that problem in there. So now that compiles. Um, with that what done, what do we need to do? We need to go back to play with verts, and we need to go and look at what we're doing. Um, We are, okay, so we're getting our gbuffer stuff with no blending. Um, so, yeah, I think if we just take this and shove it here. Oh yeah, we're out of, out of the realm of quad stream there. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Do it on the next frame. That looks terrible. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Methinks I've done it wrong. Oh, Jesus. What have we got here? Okay, so this is obviously an abomination. We're seeing normals everywhere. So I'm reading from normals and using them as albedos for sure. Um, let, let's see where we do that. Um, albedo sampler. Yes, we're looking at normal sound every single time. So normal is yes is the only one that needs that. Um, position sampler. Albedo is albedo sam. Right, and that looks absolutely horrible. So what is going on there? Why is that so aggressive? 
That's strange. So if we take the occlusion factor and we make it um, one, I guess. Damn it. Yeah, this is all super wrong. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, let's start with the simple stuff. Albedo. Cool. Let's say the color is just albedo. And then we'll prep it. Okay, so then that goes through tone mapping and everything looks vaguely, vaguely okay. Um, what happens if we do albedo times SSAO? Oh no, it's occlusion, isn't it? Well, right now it's fine. Because occlusion set to 1. Let's bring this back in. And it's probably going to complain, but we'll see. Oh, it's very red. What the... Wait a second, we've still got problems here. The function text goals were not found when compiled in composed stage. Oh, there's a there's still a reference to that around. One second, let's just go GPU function um, compose stage. That's interesting. I thought that was how we got that. Oh, there we go. Of course, it's the same as function. It's a, a macro or a special form. Okay, so we get the GPU function. Um, can we just free that? What happens if we free it? No. Okay, so that's not it. Um, there is a way to do this. Um, delete GPU function. There it is. Um, and we'll grab that. And it should be gone. Okay, so now when I recompile this, no error okay so that was just the earlier we had the function it was broken and then we renamed it and that left a broken function around in the image then every time we're recompiling stuff it was finding that thing going oh like my dependencies look okay i should recompile um so yes okay so really Okay, so what we're actually going to do is we are going to take just the X component of the occlusion because that's all we really need. And we're going to multiply that by the ambient, which is also a um, which is also a float. And then we're going to put that through a VEC3 and everything is still red. Why? Um, if we just look at the ambient color, what the... What the fuck? Man, I'm confused. Have I stopped? Okay, there's there's one possibility here. Yes, sorry, I'd actually accidentally terminated. We're going to make a quick change that is going to help us in future, right? That will avoid this problem happening. Uh, because I've been caught out by this a few times, definitely a few times on the stream. And we have, we use this helper, fun, helper macro here, def simple main loop. So what I'm going to do is go into here to find simple main loop. And it's just a big old macro. And what I want to do is at the end, see there's an unwind protect around the block. There's the loop. And then I'm pretty sure that this is... This is the unwind protect right here. So this is what we do as we're stopping. So what I'd like to do here is I would like to do as frame. Um, I would like to go um, 
Do I have, let's just see what things I have available in the ASD. I have with set F, excellent. So I'll go with set F, clear color to green CLS. So what that will do is whenever we stop, let's just, uh, let's play and then we will, oops, we'll say stop and it didn't, oh yeah, because I haven't recompiled the, because that was a macro, and so we need to go recompile it to use. Oh, I'm flagging. There we go. Okay, so play start, play stop, makes everything go green. And that also is going to happen when something crashes. So if we do this, and then we did something funky, like blah, 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 and we said abort, then this is going to go green because it will now exit that loop. So on the way out, we're guaranteed that this is going to go green. So that'll just let us know when I fucked up. <laughs> And this looks a little better now, right? What's what's going on here? So let's um, let's look back at render again. What are we putting out? So currently, um, we have the albedo, and then we add the occlusion, and we can get very subtle shadowing in there. Um, this still looks like it's got the noise on it, though. Am I not using the blurred version? I bet I'm not using the blurred version. Play with that. SSAO sampler. Let me just get back in so I can see the noise really clearly. Yeah, now it's gone. Okay. So it's subtle, but I can make it less subtle. Um... So we'll do, we'll raise it to the power of zero. So that turns it off, that turns it on, that turns it off, this turns it on super strong. Okay, so off, way too strong, off, way too strong. It's just to show that we do have some definition being added by this thing. Um, so that's cool. Okay, so. We're meant to be adding light amount. When we do that, everything goes to shit. So what is happening? Um, it's going to be about this loop then, I guess. You know? Um, is there really no ambient? Is that the, the, uh, is that the case? Let's have a look. Uh, so ambient. Yeah, there's no ambient. So let's set the ambient to be... 0.4 or something. Let's just bring it up and let's take out this lighting so far and so we can... All right, so this is the, the only contribution now is diffuse power is going to be zero. The ambient is going to be the ambient times the occlusion. And so, yes, that's this is us applying our ambient occlusion. So any definition we're seeing here that, that wasn't originally there is be, being done by our ambient occlusion. Seems a bit weak. It's not very impressive to me right now. Um, but what's more annoying is that, um, yeah, this is just fucking wrong. Oh, wait a second as well. We passed in that world to view matrix, right? Did we use it? Yeah, of course we did. I'm guessing that was wrong as well then. So I'm guessing we just screwed up here royally. Um, if I just put LPOS here, what happens? It actually looks way better, even though I know that this is in the wrong space. Oh, no, it doesn't. It just looks like garbage. Something's wrong. Okay. So this is... We're iterating through the lights. We are... Oh man, it's just one of these cases I don't think. I just think the way I'm doing the lights is wrong. So we'll take a second to read the comments and then we will go back to it in a slightly clearer head. That looks trippy. Correct. 
Is anyone work, was, ah, is anyone working on supporting compiling Lisp to WebAssembly? I remember back in the day when some of that stuff was being standardized that there was someone complaining about certain decisions that were being made, making it difficult to implement. I think it was conditions from Common Lisp. So, hey, Jace. So I think, yes, I think there's... I think there was at least someone trying to make sure that WebAssembly would be able to be used for things like Common Lisp. I haven't, I don't know if anyone's actually working on compiling to WebAssembly though. It feels like Common Lisp would be a very heavy target to have in the browser. Unless you had an implementation where you didn't have to ship the compiler. Because that would be a, a bit much. Even, uh, yeah, I mean, Clojure goes to quite some lengths to strip down its executables. Yeah, the condition system is interesting. Ah, it's getting a bit chilly in here. Right. Um, what do we do now? So if we just use, oh fuck, sorry, I'm on the wrong computer and I've just opened up a ton of windows. Let's not do that. Let's get back over here. If we just took this out and just did light. Oh, wait. Am I an idiot? Or did we just... Yeah, because of course these are all wrong because they're all in the wrong space. Did we... Wait. We calculated this fixed light, and then we never used it. Now, it's still wrong, though. You see it right there. That is all shit. What have I done? I don't know, guys. I don't know. I should have looked at this more before the stream... But I just had no time. Right, let's have a look. Do, do, do. Okay. So before, they didn't use this. They got a null from the normal map. They transformed it by the... Um, yeah, by the uh, tangent by tangent normal matrix. And that put it in world space originally. So it was a world space normal. And then they did their thing down here. They, they did it. We did it. Um, And then, yeah, then it has the clear up stuff. What is this? I just want to check something here. No, that's correct. <sighs> something stupid. I'm actually going to reintroduce that malt thing. <laughs> Wait, we actually removed it from the pipeline. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Let's just have a quick look and see what malt was used for. Some things are passing in, malt is one. But that's it. Yep, don't know. Okay. No. 
how we stare and hope something comes to us. Um, so let's see if we might have these correct positions and normals. Um, Yeah, so wherever we calculated that, let's go back up here. The view normal. The view normal came from this, where we took the normal from the map, which we did here. Assuming we did that correctly. We then multiplied it by TBN. Then we normalized it, then we shoved it in the view norm, and then that was kicked out of the fragment stage into our shader and then we sorry into our fbo and then we read it back and normalized it and it all should have been right so what do we do well i mean I suppose there's this tbn thing here so but we passed before we passed the matrix from um yeah let's have a look at glsl um varying interpolation there we go that's what i want to know Oh no, not from here. Ooh. I'm not, let's, uh, let's open those, but it's not exactly the resource I want. Um, let's have a look at varyings. Yeah, varying is an old qualifier. We're really put, talking about as inputs and outputs and stuff like this. Um, Just look for interpolate interpolation qualifiers. Certain inputs and outputs can use interpolation qualifiers. They are for any values which could be interpolated as a result of rasterization. These include vertex shader outputs. Yes. Um, So yes, how does this vertex shader inputs? It doesn't say it says fragment shader outputs. No, I want vertex. I want fragment shader inputs or vertex shader outputs. Um, Keep going with that interpolation, interpolation, interpolation. Is there any more? No. God damn it, we're gonna have to go to the spec, I'm pretty sure. Okay, um, all outputs of the vertex shader are per vertex. When you set, oh, that's okay. Yeah, but that doesn't really tell me. Have a look at this. All right, let's do this. GLSL matrix interpolation. Let's just see what it does. The other thing we could look at is in learn open GL, this must have come up when we were looking at um, normal mapping. Tangent space, TBN matrix, da 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 da, -da. then kidding me was that all done on the CPU
tangent by tangents passed in. I oh, know, here we go. In the vertex main stage, we do this. Okay. And then in our outputs, they put the matrix three. Okay. There's nothing about interpolation. I mean, I suppose it makes sense that it'd be okay, but. Nope. Okay. So, what are we going to do? This is the bit where I'm a little bit stuck. Um, we could just make up something for now, as far as lighting goes. We don't actually need it, to, like, for the. We've got the proof of concept that the actual ambient occlusion stuff works. It's the it's the old lighting code that we've got here that is fucking everything up. Um, so I can live with us not getting any further than this today if need be. And I mean, it would be nice if we could, you know, crank up the occlusion factor a bit. Just so you can see it on the stream, yeah. We're able to cal calculate that from the geometry. Yippee doo. It's hard to see. Where's a place that we might be able to see? Maybe contact points down here. Yeah, it's subtle, but if I bump it up a bit. Problem is by doing this, it darkens everything, but you can still see that there's a little contact shadow down there. But yeah, that's a little dissatisfying about the lights though. Um, and I guess it's because I'm, I've got them in the wrong space or the strength is all out of whack. I mean, the strength shouldn't be out of whack. Does the fact they're in clip space affect um, Metian has just asked a question on pipelines, which is a fantastic distraction from the fact I don't know what's going on here. So we will do that. All right, so. Um, could you please explain a little how pipelines are con connected, like an overview of the flow? Sure. In, um, in, in um, Keppel in general? Or are you talking about in this particular project? If it's Keppel in general, I'm happy to. I oh, know I can do the other one too, of course. Um, I'll just wait for a second. In this project, okay, so we have way back up here. We start off, we update our camera. We grab our resolution from the current viewport. Um, oh, wait, sorry, we set the resolution of the current viewport to be that of the current surface, which is this window. And we get here, we bind an FBO, which is our G buffer. Um, yeah, we get the FBO from the G buffer and we bind that, we clear that FBO. Um, which we can actually just do with this now because um, I fixed some bugs in Keppel. All right, then, well, that's a good point. Thank you. This is a good start. With FBO bound, we need to clear, um, probably need to clear each of them. As frame, I think that automatically does a clear, like that's a, a clear followed by a swap at the end. Yeah, okay, right. Okay, so we populate the G buffer by looping all over all the things in the scene and then we call update on it just in case anything's moving and we do draw to current camera. That calls, well, we can just jump to it here. That's gonna call one of these two pipelines is either a thing or an asymptote thing. So we have uh, like things with regular objects, asymptote things is all this kind of scenery stuff. Um, 
Either way, the only thing that affects is the vertex stage. We're going to jump to ascent vert stage and see what we have here. In fact, both of them um, end up pushing us through this function. Um, all we're really trying to do here is fill up our um, our uh, G buffer. So what have we got? We've got our position. We're going to go through. Um, we got our model position. We transform to world position. We transform to view position. Um, we take the normal. Transform that into world and in view space. So we got this view normal here as well. We um, clip. Um, get the clip position. Oh yeah, so this is in clip space because that's what we need to return from the vertex stage. Then we take the tangent and the bytes that we get, take the tangent by tangent normal and get those into um, view space, which we actually have up here, I think. We took our, our world normal and we got it into a, a view norm. So let's have a look at this. Normal model to world yeah so really this was already done so let's just do that okay so this is meant to be our tangent by tangent normal in uh, in view space and then we create a matrix from that and then we shove that down here okay so then we've taken the view position the position in view space this matrix, our UVs, and a, um, yeah, the view space normal again. Not sure why, but let's go down here into the fragment stage. It appears we don't use this at all. We just grab the albedo, the normal from a map. Um, we transform that normal, so we don't actually need this one. So I'm gonna clean this up while, as we go. What? Really? Okay, so, um, oh yeah, we've just changed the inputs to the fragment stage. So now if we go to ascent thing, where is it? Come on. We no longer have this VEC3 at the end, so we'll have to get rid of that. Um, if we say abort now, we get the green. Um, let's recompile that and say run. Um, then, yeah, so all that, all that the fragment stage does was grab the albedo Gamma correct it, um, get, grab the normal, grab the view normal, uh, and shove them all out here, which means they end up in our G buffer. Um, just to remind us, our G buffer contains these things position, albedo sampler, normal sampler, um, and that is that. So that's that part. Uh, we then take some of those we use the position and norm we don't use the albedo sampler so i'm not sure why i put that there um, we grab the fbo the position sampler and the norm sampler where is fbo used in here it is not and we call the ssao pipeline so we've got the positions, the normals, um, this noise stuff, the hemisphere samples. View to clip matrix, because apparently we need to transform some stuff into clip space again. Um, and the screen resolution, this all went into. Here. Um, and this is where we went through and did all our hemisphere magic and um, calculated what our occlusion factor was, which eventually got sped out. 
right down here um, as a VEC4. Cool. So yes, that ends up... Still wondering why it was red <laughs> that other time. That really bugs me. I wonder if blending's on in any of these. That would be disturbing, wouldn't it? That would be very disturbing. I might have to look at that. Okay, so regardless, these things get written out to... Um, they get written out to the SSAO FBO, which has one attachment. This output is very, it, it has noise all over it. So we need to blur. So we put it into a blur pipeline, which is down here. And we do this simple four by four kernel, um, just blurring. That seemed to work fine. Our SSAO stuff all looks pretty good, to be honest. I mean, well, it's a bit darker than I expect, actually. Um, I'm still not convinced about some of my decisions regarding the normals. And then that output ends up in the blur FBO. And then we've got our final compose down here, which what the idea was, it was it would take the, the positions, the albedos, the normals, um, the SCOs, and the lights, and would calculate the final thing. Um, and the way that was meant to work was you get all these out, um, and position of normal will be used um, with the lighting information to work out the light contribution for each one. That adds up into the diffuse power, which started out as zero, and then diffuse power will be added to ambient. Ambient's the only thing we've got right now. That's the light amount. That light amount is multiplied by the albedo, um, which gives us our final color. Oh, well, final color. Um, the surface color, which is then run through tone mapping and things like this, and that is what ends up on the screen. So, that is where we got to. Um, that is the run through of our pipelines. Ah, <sighs> when it just makes me wonder, I wonder what I'm screwing up. Um, one thing I don't like actually is our blur FBO. We haven't specified the element type that's um that's a bit disturbing actually because then it's going to get shoved into a rgb8 and the information surely we want a float i want a float It's probably not only, it's not well, the whole problem, but it's part of the problem. Element float. Um, let's bring up the wrapper and let us pray. Um, no, reset FBOs. That is true. That is not what I was going for. Um, just ignore that. Oh yeah, that's going to be broken now. Let's stop and come back here. That is working quite well. I definitely know when it stopped. Um, I thought I could just get away with doing this. It should take the... Um, yeah, there we go. I don't think that will have fixed it because that was only for the, um, the blur... No, you can see the nasty artifacts there already. I think what we're going to have to do is... Um, I think I'm going to have to look into the normals. I, I The problem is I'm very weak with those um, tangent space matrices. I know that's a, like a blind side on, on me and I need to uh, go back and learn those some more. Um, what I could do is I can make a geometry shader that adds lines everywhere, and we could use that for visualizing the normals. Um, render dog. That's a very good idea, Jace. That's a good point. We should do that next week. Okay, so for those who don't know, I think we mentioned it on stream before, actually. Render dog is this kick ass program that captures tons of information about your rendering. 
um, and it allows you to step through and see all kinds of things. Um, this would likely, once we get the hang of it, be um, quite helpful for understanding at least what's going on here. It would be really cool if we can visualize normals and stuff like that. It would save us writing our own passes to do these things. Um, but we could do, you know? Um, how should we do this? Do, do, do. Trying to think of a good way for... If we did a pass where we take the geometry again and we shove it through, like, yeah, if we take the vertices and push them through a geometry shader, maybe we take those... Maybe make a buffer stream which doesn't use um, an index buffer because we only actually need the points and we treat the things just as points. And then we go and sample the normals at that. Okay, I'm blurry now. Awesome. Um, let's go screw with this camera. That's all we need right now is for that to, that to screw up. Okay, so configure video. Why does it always turn these back on? And I don't notice before the stream. Oops. Thanks, focus. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, okay, so. What's the time? 47? It's very unlikely we're gonna get a geometry shader working in that time, but we could, we could dream. Um, we could steal some code from somewhere else though. Let's go out and have a look. All right, so how does this work? Um, it takes some geometry in, in some format, which we'll decide if that's correct. Um, it there's a model to clip space to get it into the right place. Um, and it also, yes, yeah, so it sends off the position. It kicks the normal down to the next stage. Um, so we're taking in three normals um, per triangle. Because I guess we're processing triangles here. Um, that's interesting. I wonder if, like, if we do points, will these just be... A strip of one, that would be quite cool. Um, the output primitive is a line strip. Okay, so what does it do? It generates three lines. And the lines are... So for each of the points... Oh, that's quite cool. Then it uses the normal... Okay. All right, okay, let's, uh, let's try this. Um, let's find out what our vertex format is. Oh, it's actually in, oh, it's in one of these two formats. And we're gonna do it, I'm just gonna do it with these meshes, the scenery ones. So we're gonna do an asymp mesh vert. It's gonna come in here. God, my hands are just not working anymore. A bit chilly. Um, It has a position, a normals, a UV, tangent by tangent. Um, so what do we want to do here? We kind of want to do the normal transformation that I was talking about before. Uh, where is that funky one? Um, here. We could just, if we take, hmm, sorry, I'm just processing here. We take this. And 
yeah, if we just take this stage, put it here, and then what are our outputs? Um, so it returns four things, but we only need um, Let's just, yeah, let's just take these. Sorry, I know I'm waffling now because we've got 10 minutes left and I'm not quite sure what I'm doing yet. Um, let's do multiple value bind, which we can do in our shaders, which is quite fun. Um, let's find out what these things were. Clip pass. Um, sure, view pass, TBN, and UVs. Um, and then what we need to return is values, uh, clip boss, that's for sure. And then we actually need to get the normal stuff. So how do we use our normal TBN shit before? Um, let's just search for TBN and da 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 da. And so if we're already here. We just got a normal from map. Let's do this. <laughs> this is the problem, like you're trying to build stuff to debug the thing that you, like you did something wrong because you don't really know what you're doing. So now you're doing something else to try and debug it, but you don't know what you're doing really there either. Um, so it's not exactly the most hopeful fucking situation, is it? Um, Okay, so we take our this is gonna be our normals vert, right? And that is let's just make sure we swizzle that down to the requisite X Y Z. Um, normal map is undefined. Sure. Normal map. Samba 2D. What's well, normal map? Okay, not normal map. Yep, there we go. Norm from map is undefined. Norm from map. Is this formatted correctly? Yeah, this is the body. Should we let star? How is that working? Um, Okay, so that compiles now. Good. And then we've got normals geom and normals frag. I think when we get to here, because th this is in view space, aren't we going to have to translate that into into clip space as well? Which means you'd be doing a pro projection, uh, you put the projective projection matrix on it, and then do the W divide. Let's just see if we can get something to draw first, and then we'll worry about what's right and what right. Okay, so draw normals matrix. Um. <laughs> yes, because normals vert doesn't take this. Let's look for what it takes. An acid mesh. Okay, so now we've got draw normals. Let's go to play verts. Um, now we have to do updates. Blarg. Okay, so this draw down here. Um, Asymp thing. That's what we kind of need. So, something like this. Come on. There we go. Um, what do we need being fed into it? Probably everything that we're asking for here. Uh, model to world, model to view, view to clip. We don't need albedo. We don't need, we do need normal map. We don't need now. We don't need lights. We do need scale. We don't need malt. There we go. This is going to be called, we're actually gonna do a lot of things here. We're gonna do um, draw norms. Um, then we're gonna change this to def generic. 
Then we're going to put this down here and say method, and then we're going to go and get this signature and pop it up here. And we don't have the types because this is def generic thing and done that. And then, oops, that way. Um, what have I done wrong? Don't need that name. Because that name is meant to be here. And then we need a default implementation, which is just going to do nothing because then we're going to call it on everything. Um, so camera and thing, and the result is nil. There we go. Okay, so now we've got draw norms. We are going to go back to play with verts. We're going to go to here. I'm just going to drop this down for a second. I'm going to bring this back. And we are going to call draw norms with current camera and all that shit. Grab that. And this is almost certainly not going to work. So brace yourself for things not working. And as you can see, nothing happened. Which it won't. It won't. Of course it won't. And the reason it won't is because this is... Fuck's sake. Um... Can we turn off the depth test? With ZF depth depth test function to nil. Is that gonna help? No. Ah, oh, fuck. Oh yeah, of course. Oh, we're, we're drawing out to an FBO. That doesn't help. Um, there we go. Uh, those positions look weird. Oh no, there are some very small normals poking out. And they all seem to be wrong. Um, <laughs> so we've got a slightly hairy world right now. Um, we're also seeing the ones in the background because, again, we've got the depth test turned off. Uh, let's go to our geometry and just say what the magnitude is. Let's turn this up to 0 0.9. And you can see it's a little bit hairier. Let's do 2. And we can see all these normals. Actually, you know, there are worse looking normals in the world. Uh, no, some of them look pretty suspect, actually. All right. Okay, so that's somewhere, something from at least me to start with uh, looking into this. I'm going to turn those up a little bit longer. Um, I think that's it for now. I'm pretty happy that we got the um, ambient occlusion stuff working. Kind of bummed that I couldn't get the um, the lighting stuff, but I can feel that my head is not going to uh, is not going to really help me work out what's happened there. So I'm going to just have to come back to this another day when I'm feeling um, feeling clearer. Branch is episode sixty eight. Thank you, Medellin. Let's. Uh... What episode are we on now? I don't know. Uh... <laughs> What does what does the stream say? What episode are we at? Um, and I'll branch off and I'll I'll get that pushed as well. Um, the project is on GitHub. Yes, um, all of the tools we use are open source and available. Um, poke me on the Lisp Games Discord or IRC if you want to talk about Kepler at all. Any questions? I'm happy to look into it. I probably won't be around tomorrow because I think I'm taking a day off. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot, folks, and I'll um I will see you next time. Peace.